Welcome everybody to our last film session with Jennifer Swope, Bernadette Gerard, and Evelyn Vanderhoop um, doing the Q&A for the film that you just watched. Um, just a reminder to put your questions in the Q&A um, and Jennifer is going to give us a short introduction. Well, good evening and I hope you all enjoyed the uh, Raven's Tale journey of Evelyn Vanderhoop made by Bernadette Gerard and uh, my name is Jennifer Swope. And I'd like to acknowledge that I am coming to you from the unceded lands of the Wampanoag tonight. I am uh, a curator in the textile and fashion arts department of Boston. And I hope you'll join me in welcoming Bernadette, Bernadette Gerard and Evelyn Vanderhoop, our artists of the evening. I thought I would share very briefly with you an introduction that will just give you a sense of the time frame because I don't want anyone to think that uh, Evelyn can create this work in less than 10 months. We just were, she just reminded me how long, how long it took to make this beautiful raven's tail robe, the sky robe. Um, and so the uh, really, we started talking through the uh, Stonington Gallery in Seattle uh, really about like summer of 2017. And then I think things sort of started to get rolling about fall of 2017. And uh, Evelyn, you told me that you started spinning, thigh spinning all the warps then. The, um, <clears throat> and uh, we, we, in talking to Stonington, we said, well, it would be really great if we could document this process for future researchers, people who were interested, other artists, other artists. And that really became I think it was really your idea and Bernadette's idea to then go further and, and create this beautiful video. So, you know, really we've just been on the ride, I would say, and uh, it's been amazing. The, um, and I, so the first one, like, I think this is one of the initial images that we got actually through Stonington Gallery. And when we saw this, we thought, okay, Bernadette's gonna do a great job. <laughs> we have, we like, we don't have to worry about anything. It's, it's gonna have, both the video and the documentary photographs are going to be marvelous and and just just works of art in and of themselves. So there are 50 photographs. This is one of them that show the whole process all the way through, including all the way to the end, which I'll get to uh, when Evelyn, you came and danced, the, or presented the robe in dance uh, in February 2019. That's all. All those photographs are available on the MFA's website. So. This is actually the opposite of the conference theme. This is, this is an unhidden aspect. <laughs> we want this to be accessible and unhidden to everyone. The video that you just saw is also available on the MFA's YouTube uh, site anytime you'd like to watch it. So please watch it over and over again. So uh, about a year after that, actually just before the TSA symposium in Vancouver in September, 2018, Pam and I who were in the middle we met uh, Bernadette on the far left and uh, at Masset in Haida Gwaii, Evelyn's home, she's on the far right. And uh, it was just an amazing experience. Evelyn, you warmly welcomed us into your studio and home. And now so you can see how there's more, more robe. It was about two thirds of the way finished. And we got to see actually you weaving right there and see how this robe that we had only understood through Bernadette's photographs, which are amazing, just like how, how it looked and um, just the importance of really Haida culture and, and uh, within the culture and all the arts and, and the place. And um, so that was, that was really important to us and, and thank you, thank you both for that. So thank when you. we were there, I know, <laughs> We, were, we got ourselves, of course, excited about another thing, which is that you're coming to the MFA and Bernadette, you're coming too, to present the robe in dance. And um, we were just so excited that you could bring so many of your family and friends and community with you, including Tiffany Vanderhoop, who, who, who drummed and sang and has a beautiful voice and uh, your two granddaughters, this is Novella. And, um, it was a very special day on February 22nd, 19, 2019. Uh, Patrick and Cynthia also came. Sorry, I just dropped my microphone. This is Patrick and Cynthia. And we're all in the, in the Lindy wing. And then 
that afternoon, Cynthia joined us for the Haida weaving demonstration. So pe people who are visitors to the museum could come and actually experience Haida weaving for themselves and have a close up look of the sky robe. Um, it was a very special day. <laughs> And um, we had intended for the TSA symposium this year, if it, had, if it had not been virtual for your mother to come and do another weaving demonstration. But unfortunately the pandemic has made us postpone that plan. But in one month, your mother's tunic, Raven's Tail tunic, which we borrowed from a very generous private collector is going to go on view with your sky robe in the Native American Gallery at the Museum of Fine Arts. So with that, and it'll be up for a whole year. So I hope everyone can, who's listening and hope people can come and see it. And um, so with that, I will start with the questions. Welcome, Evelyn and Bernadette. Okay. Thank you for welcoming us. So I'll just jump right in. There's uh, a question from Loretta Crippen. And I think this would be for you, Evelyn. Uh, I would like to more information on the tassel technique that she used. Well, the fringe is a very important part of the textile. With these robes uh, were thought to have a lot of power and they're chief's robes. So uh, a lot of times in my research, I've come upon instances where people talk about how that fringe goes out as the chief dances, it swings out and they, uh, the, the power of the chief would go to, um, to um, uh, initiates in secret societies in the past. So that fringe was very, very important. And we continue to um, make sure that, um, that we do have the fringe. But with the raven's tail, which is a very early uh, technique, it actually had um, completely been forgotten. The weavers of today were not weaving this, this way. Uh, so <clears throat> The old style geometric uh, chief's robes had the tassels. So not just the fringe on the outside or on the bottom, which is an extension of the warp. Um, and uh, one side of that fringe is an extension of the weft. So, um, but in the center, in the middle of those patterns were tassels. And um, because this is such an old technique, um, and an old uh, style chief's robe that had been uh, set aside and forgotten for a while, uh, that the meaning of the tassels and where you place them is a detail that we no longer have um, that knowledge. So, but because Cheryl Samuel, a researcher and a weaver, uh, did all this research on this particular style of chief's robe, uh, and published the book with the Raven's Tale. Uh, because of that, we see that the tassels are there. And that um, as a contemporary weaver, um, I definitely want to maintain that, that uh, style. And um, for me, when I dance the robe and the tassels sp uh, swing, um, I think of, um, I, well, actually I think of our hair. Like a lot of times, um, like, why do we have these long hairs on our heads? I think that the fringe was to, to uh, connect with our environment, connect with the, the, the nature of our environment as well as the supernatural of our environment. So I think that those tassels were important and I definitely would um, wanna make sure that uh, my robes have fringe and, um, and tassels. Thank you. Um, Evelyn, I have another question for you from Sandra V. She asks, she says to Bernadette, beautiful film. And her question is, what makes the raven's tail robe feminine and the other robe masculine? 
Yes, my mother did mention that in the movie and or in the film. And um, well, the form line art is traditionally done by the men. Women were, that was not our role, was, our role was not to paint. Um, and the majority of our carvers were men. Uh, women did carve, um, and I think now a lot of women have taken up carving tools. But um, uh, the form line was really the, um, the men were the experts. They are the ones that probably evolved that form line. So when uh, we had the geometric patterns, they were the earlier textile, then it evolved into the form line. And so the form line for my mother, who's living her 91st birthday uh, coming up next week. Um, oh my. <laughs> happy birthday. Yes, happy birthday. That she remembers those roles, right? Oh. That, uh, that the um, form line was the, um, that was the forte of the men. And so she talks about the uh, geometric pattern as being very feminine. And I think that that is because uh, everything was done by the women when it came to those, those geometric patterns. Uh, the women uh, spun the wool, the women planned the uh, designs and the women wove those patterns. All of it was done by women. And, uh, and we, because there were so many deaths along our coast for so long uh, and so much, so much death that we lost a lot of people swiftly. And so those geometric patterns are not, again, um, thoroughly understood as far as their message, but we do feel because it was done by women that it probably had to do with genealogy, our ancestors, our um, past in, the um, genealogy of our past into our future. So I think that that is pretty much what my mom was referring to. Um, actually, can I ask a question, Evelyn? This is my own, because um, I remember we were talking about this, I think when we were on Haida Gwaii, and um, I think it's when we went to the Haida Gwaii Museum and we looked at all the basketry and that photograph uh, that you included in the video, Bernadette, of the basket being woven up like upside down from the bottom down. Mm -hmm. And um, so do you think like some of the geometry uh, in, or the geometry in the raven's tail robe is sort of, could it be more related to the way baskets and mats were woven? Um, yeah. Yeah, they, it, it actually, we feel that the um, basket that techniques evolved to the textiles. So um, a lot of, even the, a lot of the techniques are very similar to the spruce root basketry of um, the, um, the, we, the, the particular weaving techniques of the spruce root basketry has evolved and you find them in the uh, geometric um, ah. row the raven's tail. Yes, thank you. Um, we have another question from Jill Kinnear. Evelyn, your weaving is beautiful. I wondered about the significance of the sea otter trim when the sea otter is considered negatively evil, if I've understood correctly. And I'll make that live. No, it is not the sea otter that we consider evil. It's the land otter. The river, the river otter. There's two two otters that uh, live in our area, and it, the sea otter um, has never been considered evil. Um, we respect all animals. We respect all beings that we share our environment with, uh, and in the sea and in the land. Uh, but for some reason, that land otter must have. Uh, taken a chunk out of an ancestor years ago or something. Because <laughs> uh, we don't, we feel pretty squeamish if we see a land otter. And it's from our stories, from uh, the, uh, the stories that came from our ancestors. So it's not the sea otter. And the sea, our robes, both the geometric robes and the Nahin robes, the for form line chief's robes, they are always topped with fur. And it's because they're dancing robes. We dance with them, we wear them. And um, so that 
the fur softens the feeling around our neck as we're dancing uh, instead of like a hair shirt, you know, you, you don't want to be, right? So, um, so that we top it with, it could be mink, it could be sea otter, it could be beaver. And a lot of times when I weave for non-native collectors, I'll put beaver up on top of that because the sea otter is, well, it has been in the past been designated as a endangered animal. Now they, they've upped the desert, they're, they're doing so well back in our environment um, so that we uh, no longer, it's not in, an, it is not endangered anymore. They have upgraded uh, oh. its, but um, yeah, so um, I, I often put the beaver on the road because then that won't have any legality uh, problem going across borders and things like that. Yes, and, and for the record, the MFA <laughs> Sky Robe does have sea otter, but we have the very special um, tag that came with the pelt. So um, it is, uh, we didn't know, no federal laws were broken. <laughs> That's right. Um, and this uh, next question comes from Sonia Lind. Uh, this is such a beautiful mix of arts, filmmaking and weaving. What are your plans, if any, for a future collaboration? Well, we're open to anything between ourselves. We really work together as a team. And this has been just such a pleasure for me to, to uh, listen and learn so much, which um, I've really, she's really, Evelyn has really educated me and opened my eyes to so much of the art. So now that when I turn around, I see, I'll see the, uh, you know, the form line, pictures of a, you know, whale or, you know, the tongue in the mouth of, of another critter. And then I, I, I think about these things more than I would before. Like, you know, I grew up in Vancouver and I was like, I could see a lot of the totem works and, and, and I didn't understand any of it, but now I'm, it all relates together. So we're hoping that once this pandemic is um, finished, we can be able to get together again and, as you know, um, Haida Gwaii has, been, has also been in, in terms of lockdown, they don't allow people to come in and we don't wanna give anybody any disease. So we're all keeping to our own, own turf. So I'm hoping in the future we can do some more work, but I've really, really enjoyed this journey. Mm -hmm. I, I know Bernadette from before this collaboration, right? I mean, for years, uh, we used to be neighbors. <clears throat> in our, our winter place. And um, so when uh, the gallery and the museum said, take some, take some uh, photos of your progress. And I, I have a really nice canon. And, but I flew down to, um, to where uh, we, we uh, winter. And so I didn't want to carry the big heavy camera. So when they were saying we need progress photos, I knew Bernadette was good with her camera. I mean, she's gone viral many times or a few times in uh, with her, her, um, her photography and her videos and stuff. So I knew she was good at what she did. And so I, I asked her during uh, one of our dinner gatherings, I guess it was. And I said, you know, could you come up every once in a while to my place and and take progress photos. And so she did. And her stills were very well received. <laughs> yes. I think Jen, you must have said, well, take a few, you know, give her a few questions and take a few, you know, short video clips. And so Bernadette did and sent that in too. And then it just evolved. It was, it was a great, great, uh, uh, I guess you'd say it, it evolved. Uh, uh, organically. <laughs> well, I was, I'm a retired nurse. And so um, I was took up photography as a serious hobby and, and in very enthusiastic um, hobby in my retirement years. And so I, I basically when Evelyn asked me to do this, I came over and I did some shots. And then I thought, man, this is too beautiful to not to not put it in, in video, you know, and so um, with the equipment I had with me down there, we, 
we just played around and then we sent a few shots in and then next thing you know, Stoning between the Stonington Gallery and MFA um, Museum of Fine Arts Boston, they said, well, we want you to do the whole project. <laughs> so uh, we're like, okay. <laughs> so gotcha. it kind of just sort of uh, expanded from there. And so it became a wonderful journey. And, and I learned more and more as I went along with Evelyn. And, and uh, I'm so thankful for having had that opportunity. Well, uh, Bernadette, actually, we have a question from Elena Rosenberg, and she asks, uh, have you made other films on textiles or craft, and where can she see more of your work? That's a, that's really good. Um, I, well, I do have a connection to my Vimeo page, and I, and I have, um, I need to get back into more into the video. Um, so, and I should be setting up an own, my own website, but if you have, um, I can send you my Gmail for now and then I can let you know the link later. I haven't done anything else with textiles um, other than what I've done with Evelyn. That was the first time I had experienced doing um, that type of type of work. Most of my, um, most of my uh, videos have been related to nature and um, in the Sea of Cortez with whale sharks and, and uh, birding and things like that. So um, more of nature. Um, but since then, since I've been working with Evelyn, I found that I do really enjoy doing um, stories. I'm, I, I found out basically I am a storyteller. And so I'm looking forward, looking for some new projects once this um, pandemic has sort of settled down. You do have a beautiful Instagram page. I am a, I'm a subscriber. I always look and uh, get inspired by it. Do you Thank think, you. do you think you're, um, I just, I think your friendship and rapport, it, it's one of the first things that struck me when, when Bernadette, you sent like the small clip with it and, and Evelyn, you're wel wel welcoming people through the door in, in your house in Mexico. And I just, I, I felt like, um, I felt like I was in watching that. I felt like I was a part of your, your bond and your friendship and, and your conversation. It, it, that's, that's, that's the way I felt when I, when I've seen it over and over again. <laughs> well, we do have, um, we have clicked in terms of our relationship together. We work well together as a team and we're very relaxed together. And, um, and so um, we work hard too. We're not just relaxed. We, we're very hard workers. And so um, we just inspire, you know, she inspires me, I inspire her. And I just feel like I'd like to do some more with her sometime. Explore Good. that facet really of, of um, more of the indigenous works as well. Um, Evelyn, there's a question here from an anonymous attendee and they ask, can you share more about your use of cedar in your thread, warp and weft? Yes, with the Northern geometric weaving that now is called Raven's Tail, that was pure mountain goat. And mountain goat, um, and not, not all of the hide either. The only part of the mountain goat is this soft undercoat that uh, grows, of course, in the winter because they, they live in the uh, high mountains. And so, <clears throat> so the raven's tail is done in a very gentle weave. You're twining and it's very gentle. And you handle your work gently. And that's important because your, your warps, even though they're thigh spun, they're still, and they are compressed, they still are made from that soft mountain goat wool. So if you were, you know, if you handled your material uh, very strongly, um, there would be a lot of puckering and uh, squishing and and so with the raven's tail technique that I did for the museum there it was a very gentle technique and, and it was made from pure uh, merino wool because we, I like to use merino wool because it's soft and if you looked at it under the microscope you wouldn't you wouldn't see a lot of the um the barbs that you would see with regular wool so I like working with merino wool now the Nahin chief's robes, the ones that use the uh, and have the form line art, you have to be boss of your yarn a little bit more. Your hand, you're handling 
that yarn a little bit, not a lot, but a little bit more uh, uh, bossy, tough, you know. And so um, working those form line art, uh, form line designs, you really need to have that inner uh, yellow cedar core um, that we work with it when we when I spin that yellow cedar into the wool, um, it's it's wet and pliable. So when that warp dries, the yellow cedar is stiff, and it helps that warp hang stiff because our warps in my style of weaving are the loom is a very simple loom. It's a bar loom with uh, holes drilled every inch. And then the warp is hung uh, straight down. And, and the only thing that really holds it down is gravity. So we use the, we, we call this the gravity weighted loom. And so our warp is hung down and only uh, with gravity. So that stiff um, inner core of the yellow cedar will help you control those uh, shapes as you're weaving with a little bit more uh, oomph than uh, the other style of weaving. So um, that yellow cedar is very important to our chief's robes that form the form line. Thank you. Uh, also from, I'm not sure if it's the same anonymous attendee. Uh, this is a question for Evelyn. What is your current project? Thank you so much. You are so talented. Oh, thank you. I just finished a robe two days ago. <laughs> and again, it, it took me 10 months. So it was quite emotional taking it off the loom, cutting it from its bar loom, and then putting the fur on top. And then uh, yesterday we did a dance. And um, because of COVID, it couldn't be more than, I think I had at the most, um, probably about 15 people in this very big longhouse in Old Masset. And, um, and I invited two ravens to witness, two eagles to witness, um, my sister and, you know, my husband. People came, but it wasn't, it was less than 15 people because of the COVID. Uh, situation, mm -hmm. but the collector did want to have it have its first dance in Old Masset, so um, nice. I was there and 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 provided uh, gifts for the witnesses. We had a little bit of uh, cookies and sandwiches, um, but it was very simple compared to uh, the the uh, Boston <laughs> Museum Fine Art presentation. Um, but uh, yeah, I just finished a robe and it's, it's, um, I'm very happy. It's called the, um, the uh, Many Coppers Robe. And my mother helped me name that robe. And apparently, I think we had the tradition of having copper designs on our robe because she actually found uh, the name in a book that, uh, uh, so the Haidas have a name for a copper robe. Uh, nice. So, so I was just thrilled to have my mother discover that name, and so uh, I was able to bring it out just just yesterday. So, and Beautiful. now my next project is a Nahim robe done um, through the um, Stonington Gallery. Is again um, having um, the commission. It is through them, and um, so we've been working on trying to straighten out what design and what colors, and so. Um, I have already done the heading and I'm halfway through the black border. So I'm off to another, another road. <laughs> That's lovely. Um, this comes from Pam Parmel and uh, oh, she's hi, very, Pam. I know she's out there uh, and she would like to know, uh, she'd like to know more about natural dyes uh, used in traditional Haida robes. And uh, is there like an article that you usually recommend to people who are interested in this or a source um, uh, uh, that, that talks about this? Um. Well, I'm not, I'm not really sure if there is a, an article about, I, mean, I know I have, I have written several essays that have been published and I do talk about the dyes uh, recently, with this new Nahim um, commission that I'm, I'm just starting, 
um, one of the, uh, the things was the lady had a particular yellow that she wanted and it was quite orange. And um, so I had to, I, I was so glad I had um, the backup of the traditional color. Um, and I just said, I, this is the traditional color from wolf moss and that that's the consistent color from up Yakutat down to um, uh, Haida Gwaii, it's, it's this color and it's this substance, it's the wolf moss that we traditionally used for the yellow. And so I had that to fall back on when the person wanted to do something else with that yellow. I was like, I would really prefer that we work with that consistent conventional color of the yellow. The blue is like um, Pandora's box. You can get all kinds of blue uh, because there's all kinds of uh, different sources for that blue. But um, for the yellow, there was the wolf moss. So there's some um, things that I like to stay with the tradition and like, um, but other things I, I like to play with color. But um, yeah, there's several uh, people that have written about the dyes and, uh, but right off the top of my head, I can't think of um, a, a paper right now that just specifically deals with the, the dyes. Well, it's, uh, it seems like so much of what we've talked about at this conference has been about you know the the hidden and the and the emerging and how much communities of people um, need to seek each other out and create these networks and um, and keep talking to each other about all of this knowledge that is there um, but we just we need to you know make sure that uh, it gets the attention that it deserves and um, everyone who who has curiosity and um, and respect can 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 access it and um, well it's 9 36 and we still have so many questions but I, I'm sorry I, I know people have um, dogs to walk and families to feed and <laughs> out here. We have to go to bed soon, I think. <laughs> I'm sure there are people all over the world watching. Um, so, uh, so I don't know, Evelyn, if you want to say goodbye, goodbye to everyone, but we'll turn it over to Caroline. <laughs> well, I just want to say hello. That's uh, Haida for thank you. Um, thank you so much for watching the film and hearing us talk about it. And I hope you, you enjoyed that. Thank you so much for having us and uh, we really enjoyed our collaboration together. Thank you both. Great. Well, you, thank Caroline. you Evelyn for sharing your beautiful work with us. Um, Bernadette, thank you for sharing your film. Um, and Jennifer, thank you for orchestrating all of this and bringing this beautiful work to TSA.